and welcome back to the PNN. My name is Parker Taylor. Today we're doing another inspirational speech. Well, it's going to be another poem today, but I hope you find this insp some inspiration in it and some lessons to be learned. Currently we're going through an unprecedented change, both economically, politically, and socially. And there's a lot of talk about getting more involved in your community and getting more involved politically to be the change that you want to be, especially with a lot of people graduating, both high school and college, you find a lot of these ideas and themes in many commencement speeches, mine among them. So, I think it's important today that we find out what it truly means to be a member of the community, a participating member of the political body. And I think Ralph Waldo Emerson's poem, A Nation's Strength, is by far the best poem on the subject. There's multitudes of poems, speeches, but I think this one is the most poetic and the best applicable for our current times, with many people discounting the more formal and traditional ways in favor of some more radical means of expressing change, some of it which may be good and revolutionary, but others which may be detrimental to the whole of society. So, uh, I'll read the quick summary at the beginning of it. A nation is composed of thousands or millions of people of different qualities, character, and backgrounds. So what makes one nation stronger than another? According to Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the most significant American essayists and poets and philosophers of the 19th century, he believed in the power of individualism. Emerson held that the collective strength of great and powerful people is what makes the nation great. Infinite diversity and infinite combinations. We each following our own individual paths towards a collective good. Let us begin. What builds the nation pillars high, and its foundation strong? What makes it mighty to defy, the foes that round it throng? It is not gold, its kingdoms grand, go down in battle shock. Its shafts are laid on sinking sand, not an abiding rock. Is it the sword, asked the red dust, but empires passed away? The blood has turned their stones to rust, their glory to decay. And is it pride, ah, oh, that bright, bright crown, has seemed to nation sweet, but God has struck its luster down, its ashes at his feet. Not gold, but only men can make, a people great and strong, stand fast and suffer long, brave men who work while others sleep, who dare while others fly. They build a nation's pillars deep and lift them sky high. I think that's important. We all have our own parts to play in life. And a nation is not great merely because it is rich or powerful or grand or has the largest armed forces. Each nation, as each human, has its own individual flaws. And some flaws span across all nations. But we are human. We are prone to make mistakes. As the great William Howard Taft said, we, can't, we do not expect perfect humans, thus we do, should not expect perfect government. Instead, the nation's strength comes from its people, the culture, its combined purpose. And I think that our culture, the Western culture, of individualism and independence has allowed for the greater inventiveness, self-expression, entrepreneurism, than in the other history of mankind. The Industrial Revolution alone would probably have not been able to take root had it not been for the individualistic personalities of Great Britain and the United States. Just look at France or Germany during the early part of the Industrial Revolution, where they tried to catch up but through government-sanctioned monopolies, which only led them to fall further behind. And plus, you had the Napoleonic Wars and you know pillaging and looting. That can really sink an economy. I think that the spirit of individualism is what makes a nation strong. Its ability to allow people to express themselves as they choose, and each person to walk their own, their own path as the way they choose it, rather than a forced collectivization. It allows us each to bring a different viewpoint and a different aspect of society to the table, which combines in that great cooking pot of life to create a beautiful mosaic, a puzzle, which fits together in so many different ways, and which gives us both our strength and our diversity. I think it's important. You know, different opinions from different people, while 
you may disagree with it, can be highly informative and can help you increase your knowledge about the world around you. So you must practice your own individualism, thinking for oneself, and we must also respect the individual thoughts of other people, for everyone thinks and has their own opinions. And I read, and actually I watched, a commencement of speech by a renowned technologist and futurist about the future of artificial intelligence and technology, making the human mind hackable, and how it's our generation, the class of 2020 and onward, who will be faced with the primary fallout of these technological developments, which will be coming of age within the next 25 years or so, and the impact of a computer, soon a computer program, will be able to know us better than ourselves. So that ethical quandary uh, of basically would reverse our individualism. It would make it just a bunch of ones and zeros and data points, and the computer would predict the where the collective movement of you know where crowds are going and opinions and they would manipulate it so you would remove your individual choice and your individualism in favor of basically uh, mass consumerism but on the level of where they know your most innermost wants and desires so i think it's important that we keep the spirit of individualism alive both in government and in our culture and in society as a whole so that's it for this week i hope you find it at least a little bit inspiring, and you can derive a lesson from my analysis of it, and maybe to make your own analysis of it. So, as always, this is the PNN Broadcast, signing off.